Trade agreements, first and foremost, lead to redistributions of income. Um, but many people would have you believe otherwise. And it's all very nice to pretend that economists can just look at positive economics and not get involved in normative issues so we can sort of measure the gains and losses and identify the winners and losers and lead it to the politicians to make the trade-offs. But actually, um, you know, people sneak in their assumptions, their ideologies, and so on. And it's, it's very difficult to know how to go through this minefield. And even saying you can divide economics in positive and normative, even that's full of value judgments. So um, it's, a, it's a big, difficult issue for economists. And I'm delighted to say we've got three experts to help us uh, deal with this. Starting on my furthest left, Francis Coppola, who runs Coppola Comment, who uh, I can only say uh, prolific, absolutely <laughs> prolific, uh, not only in terms of words per human, but also <laughs> the quality of them. They're absolutely exceptional. And um, I have a secret belief there's a whole department behind there. <laughs> I, I hope that's the case compared to my own output anyway. <laughs> that's been said by others. It's, it's remarkable. <laughs> Um, and uh, sitting nearest him on my left, Professor Tony Yates from Birmingham University, who writes the Long and Variable blog. And um, I don't think it's any state secret that he coordinated one of the letters to the press pre-Brexit. Um, uh, but has been you know, one of the few sort of academic economists that have been brave enough to actually engage in what is actually quite a political um, uh, theatre. Uh, uh, and so... You know, I greatly respect what he writes, but also he's probably got a few uh, uh, suggestions about how we can be more effective. And on my right, we've got Liam Halligan, who writes the Daily Telegraph. Right and now for the Daily Telegraph. Right, doing his comment right now. <laughs> so, you know, I hope, I hope you're quoting me on that. Um, so uh, uh, Liam uh, is uh, a very clear speaking person on many of these issues, and I think will give very forthright views and um, I've asked each of the speakers to talk for 10 minutes, and then it really is a question of opening up the floor because this is a problem which matters to the profession. So if I can start with you, Francis. I had a feeling that was going to happen. Those of you who've uh, encountered me before will know that I don't use slides. Um, this all stems from a lecture at the LSE about the, a couple of years ago where the Deputy Governor of the ECB Vito Costantio gave a half-hour lecture without slides, and I realised that when he wasn't using slides, everybody listened to what he was saying rather than gazing at the slides. So I don't use slides unless I've got a nice chart or something to show you, which on this occasion I haven't, because I'm not here to talk about charts, except as communication devices. Charts are wonderful things. Pictures are wonderful things. Um, but on this occasion, I think they would... Um, muddy the waters somewhat. I think I want to talk about um, how it is that economists are perceived and how we perceive ourselves, how we perceive our relationship with the public. Because I think at the heart of understanding how we can communicate is kind of understanding that relationship. And I mean, it's become apparent to me, um, Tony will probably throw brickbats at me in a minute, that there certainly has been a perception in some parts of the public that economists are kind of somewhat detached from reality, that um, they can come up with all these wonderful research full of lots of lovely um, Greek formulas and um, you know, lots of figures and statistics and charts um, and using representative agents. <coughs> and people look at them, if they come across them at all, look at them and say, what's that got to do with me? It's all too easy to think that all we need to do is communicate the, the outcome of our research and that everybody will understand it and that they will identify with it and they'll take it on board and, think and understand what relevance that has to them. And I think in the course of the work that I've been doing now over however long it is, six or seven years, that it's immensely important actually not to assume that people understand even the basics of what you're talking about, right? Um, it's really quite fundamental things that we tend to take for granted that people know, and actually the vast majority of them don't. And so I think one really important thing when we're communicating, trying to communicate some really difficult stuff, I think, to people, and things, things that actually many of them don't want to hear, um, 
because it doesn't fit with their framing. It doesn't fit with what they want to believe. Um, it doesn't fit with what they've believed all their lives. Um, is actually, to, firstly, to be completely honest with them and not try to fudge anything. I had, earlier this afternoon, I sneaked out for a bit and met um, somebody from the Economics Foundation to talk about, as it happens, the, um, their ideas for um, a network of, of regional banks, um, which they are sort of framing as a breakup of RBS. And I said to him, look, if what you want to do is break up RBS and put it into resolution, then say so. Don't try and fudge this by making it a, oh, we can convert RBS into this, because the reality is you can't. And there are literally millions of retail customers out there who would be very, very affected by any such proposal, and they need to know where they stand. So I think that's the first thing I would say. I don't particularly wish to have a go at Neff about this, but I think sometimes we can all be guilty of being less than clear with people about exactly what the deal is, what the situation is, and what it means for them. And that, I think, brings me to my second point, and this is probably where Liam will throw brickbats at me, <laughs> that when we're writing about things as econo e economists, it's awfully easy to, in a way, to, to be quite academic and quite dry about it and, make, and detach it from real lives. I made myself read the Daily Mail recently. No, I, well, I, it's, it's a little bit of a story, actually, because I was... Um, hiding out in the, in the um, uh, service station at Medway Services because uh, my, my, I have a lot of pressures on me at the moment in lots of directions, so I was finding half an hour of me time. Um, and it, while I was sitting in the service area at uh, Medway Services, um, I, was, I had a cup of coffee and I wanted a newspaper, and you can borrow newspapers there. But on that occasion, you know, the only ones they had were the Daily Mail, the Daily Express, and I, um, <laughs> which was not a great choice. And I looked at them and thought, well, I diss the Daily Mail a lot, I criticise it a lot, and I don't read it. So if I'm going to criticise something, I really need to read it. So I picked it up and I read it. And yeah, there are things in there that I think, oh, that's rubbish. Yeah? We would all do that. But I think what really came home to me, and the reason why their message is so powerful and sometimes ours doesn't get through, is that all the time, throughout the paper, they are talking about people. They're talking about ordinary people and people's lives. There are individual stories there. There are a lot of sub-stories there. There was a whole page about something awful that was happening in the NHS about patients with dementia being kicked out in the middle of the night and sent back to their homes to sit in the dark. And they had individual stories there. And that connects with people, and people can relate it to their own lives and their own experiences, and they understand that. So the challenge for us, I think, is to say, okay, we've got this wonderful research, but how can we relate that to people's lives? And so when we, you know, we, we pick up an academic paper, and there's lots of lovely stuff in there. Been, I mentioned representative agents just now, but real people aren't representative agents. It may be that just the part, when we're communicating the contents of a research paper, rather than the paper itself, but the way we get the message out, is actually to, to talk about people's lives, the power of anecdote, and the way in which it, what it means for individual people's lives. So, for example, um, rather than talking about the effect on GDP of Brexit, now maybe we do need to be talking much more about not just living standards, but living standards for particular sectors of the economy and particular people, particular groups. I know we do this to some extent, but maybe we need to do more of it we need to be a bit more Daily Mail in how we, I, sound, I know you're wincing over there, <laughs> um, a bit more Daily Mail in how we communicate what we're trying to communicate. So that would be the first thing I would say about communicating economic ideas in a way that actually connects with people and doesn't assume that they know things that they don't um, or that they are interested in kind of up there things when they're down here worrying about how they're going to pay for their, um, you know, their, their elderly care and how, how they're going to look after their, their, their dad and you know, they've got a lot of pressures on them and what that's going to mean for them. And I think it's these kind of things that are a way of getting across to people. Moving on a bit, I also want to talk a little bit about not just what we communicate, 
but also how. Because, um, again, we tend to sort of communicate in particular ways, don't we? We produce research papers and we write articles in the FT. Um, and, um, you know, perhaps less often in, in places that the ordinary public read. I do a lot with social media. Um, and it is a fact that social media is an extremely powerful way of getting messages out there. We actually have a, have a president who announces policy on Twitter. Right, and everybody now is watching Donald Trump's Twitter feed. Right, because that's where he makes his policy announcements. He actually put a whole post on Facebook about something. Right, he's bypassing the mainstream media. So our media channels, the way in which we get our messages out there is changing and we need to be aware of other ways of communicating things. <laughs> there are huge pitfalls with social media. It's not as it was when it started, when it was this nice sort of friendly place where you could just sort of share a virtual cup of tea and a biscuit and have a chat about banking, which is how it was when I first joined it. Um, now it's heavily siloed um, that there are vested interests on social media who drive the agenda and um, drum up followers and those followers talk to each other and actively conspire to silence or freeze out people whose views don't conform with theirs. And I think um, one of the things that, and that makes it very difficult for people who are presenting perhaps a rather uncomfortable message to be heard. And so one of the challenges we face is actually getting our message heard at all, given the, the way in which these kind of very powerful um, new media are becoming siloed. So I was thinking this thing, thinking how the heck do we deal with this? Because it is a huge problem. Um, and I think that in a way, perhaps we need to be a bit more canny about finding who the influencers are um, and saying, rather than just saying, right, we can produce an academic paper and write a piece about it and put it out there on social media, but actually think about who we need to influence. And some of those people might be people that we kind of go, ugh, about. No, Nigel Farage. Because if those people are spreading economic information that's actually wrong and actually harmful to their own followers, to their own people, then in a way we have failed, our, failed in our communication duty. We have to influence the influencers. <coughs> um, Angus has given me two minutes, so I, um, those are some thoughts for you um, so to leave it there. But I guess I would sum up by saying that we need a much more, I hate to say it, populist touch in the way in which we communicate our ideas and our, our information. And we need to be thinking about who it is who influences and how we can influence them. Okay, thank you very much indeed. <coughs> Tony. Thanks. Um, my, um, I have actually got slides, but I haven't made it here. But, um, <laughs> yeah, they, are there. they are there. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, they are. Yeah. I apologise. They They're really just speaking notes, so it's not, there's no nice charts. Francis is right, you don't really need slides unless you've got. Uh, good visuals, and I haven't. <laughs> um, so this is going to be very much like, you know, how can a um, member of Ivory Tower who has never had to confront the University of Life tell the hoi polloi better what's good for them? And um, there's no way around that, really. Um, it's really more of a quick run-through of a bunch of obstacles that, um, to good communication that presented themselves during this incident that uh, Angus told you about, uh, where, whereby a small bunch of us, myself, Simon Ren Lewis and uh, Paul Levine, decided to write a, um, a letter and try and get academic, uh, academics to sign it. Um, and it prompted initially by um, seeing the, the well-organised effort from the economists for Brexit lot, which was getting a lot of publicity. Um, so this, this, it, these remarks are predicated on the idea that it did, didn't go terribly well um, from the point of view of getting our economics across. Um, and I've got no idea about how to do better. Um, it's not really my, my forte, but uh, I hope, hopefully by telling you about how badly we did it, you could infer something yourself about how we might do better. 
So from my perspective, it seemed close to overwhelming. This is the perspective of you know, not, not, not living in the university of life, um, uh, but living in these you know, made-up models. Um, it seemed close to overwhelming that Brexit was uh, likely to be bad uh, from an economic point of view. And despite, despite that, uh, people voted to leave. If they'd voted to leave for purely political reasons, that would have been fair enough, and there no, would be no reason that, to think that the message uh, didn't get across, but I don't think that's true. Um, I think there was a communication failure for several reasons. Uh, just list, list, list a few anecdotes, but not comprehensive. Leeds claimed that migration had net costs for us all. Uh, really did cut through, and I think that was false. Um, also, they had enough of experts. Gove comment. Um, I think really that also resonated, and you know, it was particularly um, despairing. But there are also a bunch of other uh, smears directed at, at us. Uh, um, gave an example of Ruth Lee, who was quite good at this. She, but one of hers was that we were all subject to tired groupthink. I certainly would have uh, would have agreed with tired at the time. Um, um, and maybe I'm not. Uh, if you are a group thinker, you, you'll never know it. But uh, things like that, I think, really did bite. Um, from our perspective, the media seemed at best to give parity between the pro and anti economist position, which, of course, you know, living outside of the University of Life is ridiculous, uh, but at worst, uh, quite often snuffed us out. Um, some examples of how, of how difficult it was getting the message into the press. So, uh, Kamal Ahmed, the BBC's economics editor, I think, didn't mention uh, our letter at all um, on his blog or the main coverage, despite mentioning quite a few, few other contributions from, uh, from the Brexit <coughs> side, uh, including, I think, a letter from historians, which was on the pro-Remain <laughs> side, which seemed to be particularly galling. Um, Newsnight didn't mention us, you know, that hotbed of um, uh, Remain liberalism. Uh, F our FT, where we first sent the letter, refused to take it. Okay, we were preaching to the converted there, really, uh, so no great tragedy. The Times did, did eventually take us. Um, it, we felt that lots of other organisations were reluctant to cover a letter because it didn't constitute a story. That was one conversation I had in private. Um, and I suspect also it was about not wanting to concede publicity to a commercial rival, given that the letter mm. arrived in a, uh, on the pages of um, Times newspaper. Another, another example that was particularly personal to me was my appearance on the Daily Politics show run by Andrew Neil. Uh, which was a, a, you know, a very amusing uh, one-sided ambush. You know, it was, I, can I can laugh about it now, but um, it wasn't funny uh, to live through it. Uh, the most amusing moment was trying to get across this point about the difference between conditional and unconditional forecasts. So I had, you know, in my sort of you know uh, points to make uh, list that I'd made for myself. Um, Having interacted with the, the former governor of the Bank of England's press office, so I knew what you know, knew how he prepared. Uh, this story that had cooked up, I think, by uh, Giles Wilkes, Wilkes, who was then at the FT, about you know, well, you know, I've no idea how how uh, heavy you're going to be in ten years, but if you eat pizza every day for ten years, I can sure as hell uh, guarantee you're going to be fatter. And as I started to tell the story, I, it just clocked in my mind that Andrew Neil himself is, you know, is somewhat. Oh portly individual and that kind of threw me off <laughs> threw me off balance and so I had to, I put it in a rather pompous way in the one you know so one if one were to eat croissant oh, no. and uh, my dad who googles googles my uh, media appearances furiously unearthed this reddit comment you've got to see this guy he totally got smashed by Andrew Neil and at some point he just starts talking about cakes for no apparent reason that's hilarious so what I thought was a sort of mini success also seemed to be a big failure Okay, contributory factors to all that uh, going wrong. Um, the public and the media, I do think, find lots of economics hard, uh, understandably. And in that context, if there are two arguments on either side presented to them, then it's perfectly rational to treat them with parity. And that's sort of what happened, even though I don't think it was fair. Um, economists' reputation was heavily tarnished because of the financial crisis. And also, uh, everyone is used to the authorities, the government, uh, uh, even the central bank, misusing economics and statistics in a rather defensive way. So discussion had already been partly debased. And that, of course, emerged during the campaign itself with the, you know, the emergency punishment budget, which is a really silly thing to, uh, to threaten. 
no basis whatsoever. And the, the way that the, um, the Treasury forecasts were couched in terms of sort of certain losses of particular pounds from your pocket. Um, another factor, I think, was the sort of inflation, inflated expectations about the omnipotence of um, economists and the economic establishment to deliver stability and that kind of mutates mutates into scorn and suspicion afterwards so you know before the event for example the bank of england were very defensive about uh, claiming that it was that it was their a good policy that had generated macroeconomic stability and many academics of course had already figured out that it may well be largely good luck but that wasn't that, that wasn't allowed out there and of course then we you know the establishment pays the price afterwards some conceptual difficulties that i think hampered um, the, uh, hamper uh, getting talking about economics or the following, uh, and people in the media and also in government, and I suspect people out there in the University of Life uh, fail to grasp some of these concepts. At least it seems to me, uh, uncertainty, you know, basic notions of probability really seem to, people really seem to struggle with that. The concept of a forecast, what it is, the difference between a conditional and unconditional forecast, which just makes people glaze over, even when you start talking about cakes. Um, what, what does it mean for a forecast to be invalidated and, when, and what can be inferred uh, when it is? And a classic example again is the fact that uh, this claim that um, you know, the Bank of England and other forecasts were wrong ab about Brexit. You know, we've had one run uh, uh, to, of reality to compare with a probabilistic forecast and somehow that forecast is wrong. And you know, the whole establishment of economics is uh, laughed at again. Uh, even the idea that there is more to economics than forecasting is, seems to be something that uh, people struggle with. The notion of a counterfactual. So, you know, I, in, on Twitter, which um, I also inhabit on not quite the same scale as, uh, as Francis, <laughs> uh, I, I often get comments like, we, we'll really thrive outside the EU. And I said, well, that's not the point. You know, how we, maybe we'll thrive even more inside of it. But that just doesn't, you know, that doesn't really cut through. You start talking about a counterfactual, you can just see them saying, oh, you just live in that ivory tower and you don't know us real people. Uh, another example is this sort of view of migration as sort of widget supply. Surely if you supply more widgets, uh, the price of widgets is going to go down. And you had, well, following Jonathan Portes's feed, he, you know, he, ought to, he ought to get a knighthood for the, the amount of times he's tried to explain, explain that to uh, uh, you know, literally hundreds of people probably. Uh, but it, you know, it doesn't, you know, we don't seem to make progress. Uh, some challenges for people like me interacting with the media. Incentives. You know, I'm not paid for doing it or re rewarded, really, in any way um, that I can detect. Um, impact, which people talk about, it, it is a research evaluation framework concept. That is not about this at all. That's about something completely different. Um, another phenomenon is the sort of superstar journalists, even economics journalists, totally ignoring uh, people like unknown people like me, uh, not entirely unfairly. Sometimes I felt it was a bit unfair. Other times it's just like a rule of thumb to try and avoid interacting with cranks, uh, you know, who shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't spend time with them. But that was a, that was a big problem. My own personal lack of insight into the news cycle and what was legitimately a story, or given that you have to take the media you have and you can't wish for a better one, you know, what what is a story that, that they would define as one? Uh, lack of control over the timetable and content extremely uncom uncomfortable and it was very unfamiliar at first I personally and I find it very scary you know you, you realize you can you know wreck your career in a few seconds of unguarded mumbling or you know un you know misdirected remarks about cakes or Andrew Neil's weight <laughs> um, I, and the response often comes back you know, why don't you get some media media training but really uh, there's not enough repeat experiences to uh, in, in a quick enough time frame to make good, good use of it to justify what's actually very very expensive undertaking I've, I'm out of time so I'll stop thank you very much Tony Liam can I get a glass of course can we just have a couple of bits yeah, of glasses sure. Two. thanks here we go thanks Good. Thank you to uh, Angus um, and Sasha for uh, inviting me here today. I'm sorry, I'm on a I'm on a deadline. I'm typing a column about something else, but I'm I'm listening, of course. Um, and um, I'll get back to my research now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so two economists meet on the street, and one asks, "How's your mother?" And the other says, "Relative to what?" 
<laughs> What's the point of astrology? To make us economists look good. When an economist says the evidence looks mixed, that means the theory says one thing and the data says the opposite. And that one was from Richard Thaler, who's, he told me that one, he's the president of the American Economics Association, of course. An economist is someone who doesn't quite have enough personality to become an accountant. <laughs> that, that one's particularly, particularly cruel. It's also directed at me because, yes, I'm a big bad journalist, uh, but I am also a qualified economist, um, one of very few um, qualified economists who write regularly um, in the media, in the mainstream media. Being an economist means I'm an expert who doesn't know what I'm talking about, but I like to make everyone else feel as if that's their fault. That's what one of our <laughs> critics said to me quite recently. That wasn't Michael Gove, by the way. More of him later, perhaps, or perhaps not. Um, joking aside, I care about economics very much. Um, that's why I try and write and broadcast to a large audience about economics. I've worked for The Economist, The Financial Times. For a decade, I was on Channel 4 News as the economics correspondent. You tried doing economics in the madness that is a daily television newsroom. Um, for 15 years, I've written um, the economics agenda in the Sunday Telegraph every week, 52 weeks a year. Uh, I try to stay in touch with my friends and colleagues in academic economics, reading journals, co attending conferences. I'm on the advisory board of CAGE uh, at Warwick, <coughs> one of my former uh, universities, though I'm an independent advisory member. I'll say that just to reassure Nick. Um, I've also ha been involved over the years with helping the ESRC under various guises, and they funded my postgraduate research. So before I talk about Article 50 and Brexit, I'd say I see a great deal of good work going on in our universities and of course here at the, the National Institute. That's despite the criticism thrown at our subject, often unfairly, as Tony said. This is a great time to be an economist. The tectonic shape plates uh, of, of policy are shifting. Global trade uh, is moving, not only in the aftermath of recent electoral surprises, which are on all our minds, but the more general long-term shift of economic gravity from the big Western economies to the rest of the world, not least Asia. I'm very happy to see that economics is now combining with other disciplines more and more, anthropology, geography. When I did my degrees back in the late 80s and early 90s, our subject was, was imperialistic, like a sort of intellectual death star. No other discipline had anything of value uh, to contribute. It's great to see now psychology, history, getting a, a proper look in to economics. Fantastic. And the research proposals that I look at, it's exciting to see economists getting into grips with sophology, with rapid technological change, in a broader sense with big data. And I tip my hat to all of that. In general though, I think economics, and I say this from the media front line, needs to be a bit more courageous sometimes. Economists need to be a bit more willing to say in public, what they often say to me in private as a trusted uh, uh, friend and interlocutor. Going against conventional wisdom if you're an economist shouldn't be seen, it shouldn't immediately be a badge of honor. We shouldn't invite contrarianism for its own sake. Uh, but if you've got an argument, it makes sense, you've got evidence, get, sticking your head above the parapet shouldn't be seen what it currently too often is. Dangerous, unwise, career suicide. I'm not here to defend Ruth Lee or anyone else, but I would say, with all respect, that few aspects of human behavior are more damaging than groupthink. And groupthink is something that our leading economists, I'm not accusing them of it, but they should be constantly <coughs> guarding against it, attempting constantly to disrupt groupthink, if that's where the evidence leads us. Groupthink should be something which the economics profession dismantles rather than reinforces. So often, large economic questions are posed and they're so high profile, so interesting, so relevant, so newsworthy, that the profession, I'm afraid, sometimes seems to choose to say nothing at all. Take the decision to build another runway at Heathrow, a third runway, rather than expanding a smaller airport, say like Gatwick, or God forbid, really expanding a regional airport like Birmingham, 
or Manchester, creating another growth centre, an alternative to London and the South East. Spend 30 seconds Googling and you'll see Britain's Supreme Courts already ruled air pollution around Heathrow breaches legal limits. To add another quarter of a million flights to the present half a million with all the extra related road traffic make, makes a nonsense of our anti-pollution legislation. The case for Heathrow apparently hinges on hub status, yet over four-fifths of those flying into the capital is as their final destination. A third Heathrow runway is estimated to cost 18 billion, given extensive home demolition required, far more than any other site, and the payments that entails. It's great for the lawyers, all the legal wrangling and compensation, but it will ultimately be ghastly for taxpayers. And that doesn't include the countless billions that will be spent diverting existing roads. Maybe even the M25, we learnt once the decision had been made. And as the true complexity of Heathrow becomes clear, ladies and gentlemen, even Howard Davis is now distancing himself from his own report <laughs> that the government used as its justification to succumb to the massive lobbying effort. We desperately need, in a case like that, say, genuine economic experts to enter the debate <coughs> not party pre, not paid by any particular side, that just have tenure at our top universities. Yet so often the economics profession, it seems to me, is too shy to come forward. It's the same with HS2, which as we just heard, could be the second worst infrastructure project the government has backed since the Second World War. Uh, maybe even the first. I wonder what is the first? I wonder what... Again, there is a conventional wisdom, of course, promoted by Whitehall and endlessly well-paid consultants, that HS2 is the way to go. It might be, but surely it seems to me we'd get more bang for our buck investing in lower profile commuter lines around Bristol, Sheffield, Leeds, Manchester, London. They're places where people so often struggle to get to work. Wouldn't that do more for our productivity and regional policy than making the journey time from London to Birmingham a bit shorter, turning Sutton Coldfield into a commuter suburb of the capital? Again, I'd say it's a decent question. I guess it's a decent question, and I'd really like to see some genuinely independent economists asking it. Then there's QE, the biggest monetary experiment of all time. What are the long-term allocative implications? What are the short-term prospects for unwinding? The conventional wisdom, of course, is that everything will be okay, and it might be. Maybe we can go on expanding central bank balance sheets forever. I don't know. But again, I'd like to see some demonstrably expert yet undoubtedly independent, not linked to central bank analysis. Read my uh, blog. Again, almost, <laughs> <For mine. laughs> indeed, indeed. Again, almost all academic research though on monetary policy tends to steer away from asking the really tough questions. And so we come to Brexit. So, <clears throat> strike me down. I eventually decided to vote for Brexit once the then Prime Minister came back from his negotiation with, in my view, very little. And I guess that pits me against most of you. But that's probably what happened back in the late 90s and early 2000s, when I wrote many columns saying that the UK shouldn't join the single currency. And I wonder if any of you have changed your mind about that. However any of us voted, and I expect most of us in this room voted Remain, as most economists did overwhelmingly, it strikes me that we all have a duty to say what we know but also, crucially, to not say what we don't really know. So we had our exhaustive 400-page Treasury report that said straight after the vote there would be an immediate and profound economic shock, a soundbite, of course, repeated verbatim by the Chancellor over many, many news cycles. That isn't what's happened. Does that mean the, the economy's out of the woods? <coughs> of course not. Does that mean there's still huge economic uncertainty about Brexit? Absolutely. Does it mean that we as economists should all be slightly more willing to co question conventional wisdom? I'd say that it does. Economists often say that leaving the EU will lead axiomatically to a reduction in FDI. It might, it might not. What I'd say is that even without the tax cuts and deregulation, which some say will accompany Brexit, I'm not so sure, again, the big technology firms are still piling into the UK. Apple, Google, Facebook, they've unveiled plans for further expansion, consolidating us as Europe's main tech hub, even after the, after the vote. No one serious still insists Brexit will harm London's position as a global financial capital. Many, many former Remainers 
are now saying the opposite. Dyson's just unveiled plans for a new Wiltshire campus employing thousands more engineers and scientists. Boeing's just announced Britain will host its first European factory, as we heard earlier. During this Article 50 negotiation, there will be a propaganda war. There remain a number of politicians and peers determined to reverse this Brexit vote, an outcome I believe wouldn't only be undemocratic, but also would seriously scupper our negotiating hand, but more definitely prolong uncertainty relating to our EU status. Now that definitely would upset the FDI. It could also hammer our credit rating, by the way, and cause a genuine sterling crisis. <laughs> it's a great time to be an economist. The challenges are massive. The level of public interest in economic issues, should we choose to meet that public interest, and I fully endorse Francis's um, view about trying to make economics more user-friendly, is huge. During Article 50, highly technical discussions will be conducted in a cauldron of public opinion. Political careers will be created and wrecked. Tempers will be lost. The black arts of spin and ad hominem attacks will come to the fore. During that time, economists, all of us, will be under intense scrutiny. We should say what we know for sure and admit openly when we're uncertain. We should definitely call out what is demonstrably factually incorrect, but realize there are more than one way of doing things, not allowing the best always to be the enemy of the good. We should lay out a range of feasible options rather than resorting to our own personal dogma. We should sometimes agree to disagree, even among friends, not just rushing to condemn when our particular solution hasn't been adopted. Above all, we should realize that ordinary punters running businesses, paying mortgages, meeting payroll month in, month out, often have a better feel for economic reality, sometimes even than we experts. Finally, economics, while <coughs> factually based, is of course a social science. Is it, it's inevitable that smart people will sometimes, they should, end up agreeing to disagree. Above all, fellow economists shouldn't jump to assume bad faith and take offence when dealing with those who come to a different conclusion. At a time when economists are under intense scrutiny, as we all will be during the Article 50 process, that would do our subjects serious damage. Thank you.